Okay, so now we're just gonna- Now I don't see anybody. <laughs> you have to see Bob. Do you see Bob? No. Nope. I don't see anybody either. Can you oh. see me? Yeah, now I see you. Can we see each other? Yeah, I see you. Good, and I see me and you. Let me welcome you to the Giza Show. Well, thank you. Your Say daughter and my daughter are best friends. Right. And have been for years. But I got right. to tell you one thing before I get into anything else. Right. When I was living in Oyster Bay, they came up and they were on my back porch and they put on a little skit and I yeah. didn't know anything about it, but it was about pot smoking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's pretty good. <laughs> now, I've read a few things about you, Bob. You, you've had quite a varied number of careers. From well, the textile oh. business to right. owning training thoroughbred racehorses. Right. But let me let me hear something about your your early life and your childhood first. Well, I was born in Cypress Hills, Brooklyn, in a regular, I guess, I don't know, kind of a neighborhood, but grew up playing punch ball and kicked the can and all the wonderful games and really had a great, uh, a great youth. It was just a fun time. When you're 8, 10, 12, 15 years old, and then, you know, I had all the kinds of jobs uh, you could think of when you start at 12, delivered newspapers, I del delivered meat, all a typical job uh, up till I was 16. Uh, I ended up working summers into the cemeteries, <coughs> digging ditches. Yeah. And uh, that was my youth. I, I just did everything to make a couple of bucks, you know and uh, enjoyed myself. My mother and father, uh, the sense were, his father was from Germany. He left Germany when he was two and uh, he was born in like uh, uh, 1860. And basically uh, he came over here as a two year old. So uh, it was a musician and my father grew up and in sales, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, he was selling insurance, which was fortunate, you know, during the, the Depression. He was one of the few people that worked. And my mother was born here, and her mother was born here. And so we go back a pretty long time. You know, you were talking about racehorses, and you were talking also about your job as a kid. Well, you right. know what I did at 14 years old? I used to clean the stables at Suffolk Downs Racetrack. Oh boy. For a buck. Sometimes they give me two bucks. And then yeah. the other time I used to sell the programs for the horse races. That's yeah. when I was 14. Well, we've raced at Suffolk uh, once or twice. You uh, did? Yes, uh, we've raced. Uh, most of our races were in, uh, we'd start out in, in Belmont, New York, and uh, go to Aqueduct, and then Nomath Park, and then track them down to uh, Gulfstream. And that was sort of a, the run of what we did. And this was all on a sideline. I was working at the time. So uh, that was my sideline job, which I enjoyed more than working. Oh, that's great. I, uh, one thing about Suffolk Downs, I saw it being built. I lived on like a cliff and it overlooked a big, big farm. I remember because my cousins and I used to go down and steal vegetables. And then the, the, the group that was building uh, Suffolk Downs bought that out and they built it and I had uncles that used to be in the uh, betting windows. Let's let's talk about your uh, 
getting into the textile business? Well, when I finished the high school, I wanted to get into sales. And uh, I started out in a textile brokerage firm as a junior salesman. And th that was strictly selling textiles. They, and that, that had maybe 14, 15 people in it. They were very good to me. And one of the fellas, after about seven years, he went to uh, Burlington Mills. And uh, I was very friendly with him. And he invited me over to Burlington Mills as a sales rep. And uh, then I got recruited into another big major company, Millican and Company. Uh, they wanted me into uh, management to run one of their plants and, and, and market their fabrics. So that's really, textiles was all I had. I got into the horse business like in 65 and as a lock, but getting into the horse business was more interesting get it, than getting into the textile business. This George Harris, he's since gone back, basically when you get in the 90s, they're all gone. But uh, <laughs> George Harris was one of those typical, he knew everything, you know, and his uncle, his grandfather, excuse me, uh, was in a trotting business. And uh, one day he worked for me as a salesman uh, when I was at Millican and his customer and Bob Levine and he and I went up to Yonkers Raceway where they had the auctions for the thoroughbreds. And just to, as curiosity, we went up just to watch it. We sat there and he, he looked at one of the horses that was about to be auctioned off. And he said, this horse should bring $10,000, you know, <laughs> know it all George and uh, we said well let's sit and watch the auction and see what happens well it <laughs> they couldn't get a bid out of it and finally got a bid like uh, $600 there was no one higher and he got so excited he said what how much money do you have in your pocket so between Bob Levine and myself we had $600 and he raised his hands and we bought the horse. And I said, what do, we, what do we do with it now? And that's how I got to the horse business. As it turned out, we never got him to the racetrack. We trained him down in Florida, but we sold him for about $600 again. So we got our money out. But back in the early, in the mid 60s, the tax structure was so different than it is today. We ended up with all my trips to Florida, all pay, you know, I deductions, we ended up making money. So that was uh, an interesting thing for us to keep going. But my, my next partner, Bob Levine, uh, was another good friend of mine, but he was a customer of ours. So we, uh, we decided to buy a couple of thoroughbreds. We got our taste of it, and that's how we end, ended up getting into that for the next 40 years. My partner, Bob Levine, did all the training. When he sold his business, he went into training uh, horses. So we had that advantage where we didn't have the training bill, so which was half the battle. So that worked out fine. His son, which was uh, my oldest son's age, like just about 16 when we were doing this, and he wanted to get into the horse business. He wanted to <laughs> go and muck the stalls just like you did and learn the business. His father said, no, you go get your college degree. And then when you get that, you can train. And uh, his name was Bruce Levine. Today, Bruce Levine is a, one of the top trainers at Belmont which uh, has kept me very active in the horse business. I go watch them. You meet these people through life, and uh, my closest friends at the end became people I did business with. But it was all textiles and horses and 
when you think of all the things you do in the middle of it, you know. How are you handling the aging process? Well, oh, the aging problem, you know, I don't think too much of an aging problem between you and I. Uh, my brother, my brother said to me when I was like 75, my brother Gene said, you know, do all the things you want to do because your wheels come off at 85. And I didn't know. <laughs> so, uh, I did all the things at 85, but then all of a sudden the wheels started to come off. Uh, uh, you don't travel as much. It's all stuff like that. Uh, I handled it. You know, it doesn't bother me. I had a full life, you know, so I uh, keep myself busy with uh, either reading or, you know, watching TV or going to the uh, racetrack to watch the Bruce's horses run. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time with my family, you know, my two, two I got one son in uh, Austin and one son in North, North Carolina. So we're on the phone uh, three, four times a week, and I got my great daughter over here now cooking and everything. I, you know, they said, I, as far as I was concerned, up to 85, I was a bull, and everything was fine. But uh, my, as my brother said, at 85, all of a sudden, I couldn't hear too well, and the eyes started to go a little bit, and the blood started to go a little bit, and the legs a little bit. But the, the nicest thing about me now, right now, is uh, I, I could sit in a chair and feel like a million bucks. You know, as I'm hit, sitting here with you, I feel like I'm 50 again. You know. Well, you uh, know something? It, it's the right attitude. And yeah. you have the right attitude. To me, that's the whole trick in life is the attitude. Yeah. Uh, if you have a good attitude, everything works its way out. You better believe it. That's uh, if you don't. If you have a bad attitude, uh, you forget it. But for as far as advice for the uh, the young people, attitude to me is the most important. But I also think loyalty and integrity and doing what you like. Uh, Absolutely. If you keep involved in things that you enjoy. You can go on forever. If, you, if you can, you're lucky enough to find something where you can uh, enjoy your life and work, it's like a home run. And I always had that all my life. Uh, whatever I did, I enjoyed. And, and basically, you got to make judgments on your friends. You got to have, you got to look at, the, you got to find your winners and make sure you stay close to the winners. Because every, everything that happened in my life was a recruitment from a friend that I made. We have our memories. Remember Absolutely. That. Uh, they can't, I, I, they they can't take, what's that song? They can't take that away from me. Absolutely. We have our memories. Absolutely. And, you know, there's certain, certain memories that will always stay with you more than others. But... Uh, there's plenty of great ones going on. Well, I, I want I want to thank you for joining us. Well, I enjoyed this. Nice talking to you. As I said before, I can call you Lynn now. For all those years, I, you were always Betsy's father. You know? Yeah. <laughs> talking to you, Lynn. Yeah, nice talking to you, Bob. We'll have another conversation when we reach 100. <laughs> That's a deal. <laughs> Thank you.